good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Kodarasan. Uh, he's visiting the Jackson School just for a couple of days. It's, it's been fantastic to have him here. Uh, Kodarasan got his PhD at Hokkaido University and then uh, spent a short time there as an assistant professor, then went to Bergen University. After that, returning to Japan, where he's been uh, affiliated and uh, now for a long time leading Jamstack, um, uh, the premier government institution uh, that uh, deals with marine geophysics, among a number of other things he's going to tell us about. Um, Kodarasan is right now the director general of GEMS Tech, and his talk will be sort of a mix um, of uh, an outline of their vision and their operations and science. He's an outstanding marine geophysicist himself, who's made a number of fundamental contributions in terms of not just imaging uh, the oceanic lithosphere and convergent margins, but also turning these images into a process level understanding um, of how the margins work across the time scales, including mega thrust uh, behavior. Most recently, a lot of work uh, involving uh, the um, uh, setting for the Tohoku Oki uh, M9 event, um, but a number of other margins. His work is recognized with a number of awards, uh, including an AGU fellowship, and he was recently also the Benno Gutenberg lecturer of AGU. So it's a great pleasure to have Kodarasan here, and I hand it over to him, and he's going to talk to us about imaging, monitoring, and modeling a seismogenic zone results in a future plan of Jamstack projects. Kodarasan. Hey, uh, thank you very much for our introduction. Uh, I'm Suri Kodaya from Jamstack, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Finally, actually, I originally planned to be here last December, but uh, because of some reason, I couldn't make it. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, today I'm going. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of overview of the uh, research work we Jamstack team. Uh, has been doing in subduction zone around Japan. And also I'm gonna mention a little bit about future plan. Oh, yes. And just in case you are not familiar with JAMSTEC, our JAMSTEC is a Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology. And uh, uh, in the JAMSTEC, we have the six uh, research division. Uh, we call it institute. The the one uh, is studied about the global environmental change and also uh, marine resources and the Aske tsunami volcano, uh, which is my uh, research institute. And also uh, the uh, we have the institute for studying mathematical science, information science, and also they said extra cutting edge science, but they are mainly doing uh, micro, uh, geo, microbiology. And also uh, we have the Technology Development uh, Institute. And just I found uh, you got the 50 years uh, anniversary UTIC. And uh, the, also Jamstack had a 50 years anniversary last year, I think. So we have very similar history. And uh, yes, I am. Um, uh, oops. Uh, I am uh, now uh, director of the uh, research institute uh, for studying earthquake, tsunami, and volcano. Uh, we call uh, it uh, Institute for Marine Geodynamics. And uh, in the Institute of the Marine Geodynamics, uh, we have three research center. Uh, one is Subduction Dynamics Research Center. Uh, in which they are doing uh, a large scale uh, marine geology and geophysics uh, study. And uh, the second one is our um, the uh, Center for Earthquake Tsunami uh, Forecasting. Uh, they are developing a, a monitoring system and also they are doing uh, many, a uh, lot of uh, modeling uh, simulation work. And so, third one is Volcano uh, Research Center. And uh, they are doing mainly uh, uh, studying about a marine or some marine volcano. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese National Institution for Earth and Marine Science, the one of the very uh, important mission 
of our research institute is our science contribution uh, to mitigate uh, geohazard. Okay, so I am going to talk about, mainly talk about our seismogenic zone project uh, in uh, our research institute. Uh, we uh, try to understand the strip and the coupling behavior and create uh, uh, boundary fault zone at present. And also we are constructing fault model of subduction zone. And also uh, we are, uh, we'd like to try to understand the temporal evolution of strip behavior. So for doing that, uh, uh, now, uh, I mean, we have been developing real-time continuous seafloor geodetic uh, monitoring system. And also we are conducting large-scale geophysical uh, geological survey using JAMSTEC research vessel. And also we, we are developing a technique to estimate our temporal evolution of coupling. So in my presentation today, I am mainly uh, focused on the uh, uh, monitoring and imaging uh, research work. And I think uh, the one of my colleague, Horisan, he visited uh, here uh, for some uh, workshop and he, uh, uh, I think he presented uh, what we are doing about modeling. Okay. Mm. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about two uh, area of the subduction zone around Japan today. The first topic is uh, Nankai Trough, in which we expect a uh, magnitude eight cross earthquake uh, near future. And the second area I'm going to talk about is the Japan and the Korea Trench, uh, where uh, we got the magnitude nine earthquake 11 or 12 uh, years ago. Yes, so first about Nankai Trough. The, in uh, this uh, subduction zone, the records of large earthquake are very much well documented uh, by in the historical literature. At least uh, we can uh, back the history back to the uh, 1400 years. And the diagram at the uh, left shows the history of the large earthquake in Nankai Trough. Uh, the br black bar indicate uh, area of rupture zone of the previous earthquake. If, for example, the last one, uh, last large earthquake occurred 1944, which ruptured eastern half of Nankai Trough, magnitude eight. And two years after that, in 1946, uh, we also uh, got the magnitude eight grass earthquake, uh, which ruptured western part of Nankai Trough. And before that, uh, 1854, uh, we have the, again, magnitude eight cross earthquake, which ruptured eastern part first. And two days after that, uh, we got another magnitude eight earthquake uh, in, in the western part. And before that, 1707, uh, we got a huge earthquake, which, which ruptured entire, almost entire Nankai trough. Uh, by the one single large earthquake. So we can trace uh, the history of the earthquake like this way using uh, uh, historical literature. But if you take a look at the closely this diagram, uh, the, you can see that earthquake uh, occurred not uniformly, but temporarily and spatially. Uh, for example, the earthquake interval of each earthquake are fluctuated uh, between 90 years and 260 years, which is very much compared to our life, life, uh, life time scale. And in each cycle is a pair of earthquake occurred uh, in the western part and uh, eastern part separated three, or a single large earthquake ruptured entire uh, subduction zone as a huge, uh, uh, earthquake. So those uh, diversity make it uh, very difficult to estimate a future earthquake based on uh, only our historical data. So uh, in order to solve this problem, uh, we JAMSTEC is conducting a two approach for understanding subduction zone process and also for mitigating uh, earthquake and tsunami hazard. The uh, 
One approach is earth, making an earthquake and a tsunami early warning system. And another approach is uh, evaluating and forecasting for uh, slip behavior. So I am going to, uh, I, I mainly focus on the second approach, but I'm going to show you two slides about the tsunami, earthquake and the tsunami early warning system. So uh, one of the very important infrastructure for the uh, early warning system uh, is a DUNET uh, network. Uh, as you heard uh, from Damien's uh, nice lecture yesterday, the JAMSTEC uh, constructed the DUNET network uh, in 2011 and 2016. Uh, uh, we made a two uh, DUNET network in both sides of Key Peninsula. And uh, the, those system has a 320 kilometer long cable along DUNET 1 and uh, uh, about 500 kilometer long cable uh, in the DUNET 2. two. And in total, we have 51 uh, earthquake, I mean, seismometer and uh, tsunami meter pressure gauge uh, station. And one of the key point of this uh, system is uh, we have so-called our uh, science node, uh, which uh, connect to the cable. So we can mm, uh, replace or connect our sensor afterwards uh, if you, if you need. So this is very much important uh, function uh, to use this system as uh, geodetic monitoring, as I'm going to mention uh, uh, the later part of my presentation. Okay, yes. And uh, using DUNET system, Jamstack uh, uh, developed the uh, tsunami uh, inundation early warning system. In this system, uh, immediately after detection of a tsunami wave by DUNET system, DUNET sensor, the predicted time series of tsunami wave and, and also inundation of uh, rapidly uh, displayed in this system. Actually, this system is already implemented in the local government, and uh, they are now uh, operating this system uh, by themselves uh, to make some kind of alert or also to make some kind of practice of evacuation uh, from tsunami. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, evaluate and the focused sleep behavior in this abduction zone. Uh, but uh, recent earthquakes uh, study tell us the characteristic time scale of the sleep behavior is very much uh, wide spectrum. Uh, for example, interval of megastrust large earthquake is order of uh, 100 years. Uh, but if you take a look at the so-called long-term slow sleep event, uh, interval of each event is uh, half a year to uh, 10, 10 years. Uh, and also duration is uh, half a year to five years. And also, if you take a look at short-term slow sleep event or uh, very VRF, very low frequency earthquake or tremor, interval of each uh, event is three to six months and duration is 10, uh, 10 seconds to uh, one week. So uh, in order to uh, monitor the, these kind of very uh, complicated sleep behavior, uh, we need to monitor the uh, very wide spectrum of sleep whose characteristic uh, uh, time scale of interval and duration varied from 100 years to 10 seconds. So to do that, uh, we need to uh, uh, make a continuous seafloor geodetic monitoring system. And also uh, what we want to know is sleep behavior along plate boundary, but the geodetic observation data acquired the seafloor or sub seafloor. So we need to uh, transform the seafloor displacement to the sleep motion uh, along the plate boundary. For, uh, for doing that, uh, we need uh, uh, kind of realistic 3D uh, scale, 3D image of the plate boundary fault in the entire this subduction, uh, subduction zone. So uh, 
about geodetic, geodetic monitoring, as you know, one of the very uh, successful example of CFRO geodetic monitoring is our uh, acoustic uh, GNSS uh, network. The Japanese uh, Coast Guard, uh, they uh, successfully uh, deployed and operate the uh, CFRO uh, GNS acoustic network. Uh, you can see the uh, distribution of the station at the starting point of Alo, as they have many stations in the offshore region of the uh, eastern part of Japanese island, and they successfully uh, mapped the uh, strip dis deficit distribution. And the important point is uh, the uh, current locking area is not very much uniform. It's very much patchy-like distribution. So this is a very good uh, I mean, successful uh, example, uh, but uh, the temporal resolution of this method is not as high as to uh, detect a short time uh, source of event. So, uh, for example, this is uh, their observed data, and uh, in the red dot point, they send their ship above the station and they acquired uh, 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 one data. And a couple of months after that, they send the ship again and they got their, uh, another uh, data point. So uh, Coast Guard, they have many ships, but even they have many ships, uh, they uh, only can go uh, to go above the uh, station, let's say three or four times per year. So that uh, temporal resolution is not enough to see the short term throw slip event. So in order to monitor the very much wider spectrum of the uh, 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 slip behavior of this throw slip event, several types of throw slip event, uh, we JAMSTEC uh, have been constructing uh, continuous uh, real-time C-flow uh, geodetic uh, monitoring system. And uh, yes, uh, we use the DUNET cable is an important infrastructure to trans transmit the data from sensor uh, to the land in real time. And uh, in this project, uh, we have been installing borehole uh, and the CFRO geodetic uh, observatory using drilling vessel GQ and also uh, CFRO drilling machine. Uh, which can make shallow drill hole, and uh, we deploy the uh, tilt meter uh, in this shallow drill hole. So in this map, uh, we have the uh, three borehole station, uh, as Demia mentioned yesterday, his talk, and these stations provide us very, very important data about core pressure uh, uh, variation. I briefly mentioned about that afterwards, and also the uh, we deployed a couple of tilt meter uh, sensor uh, in the DUNET 1 and the DUNET 2 using a uh, CFRO drilling machine. This uh, tilt meter also provides us very important data to monitor the slow slip event. And uh, yes, uh, our uh, system developing group, they are now developing and testing fiber optic sensor technique uh, to apply the fiber uh, sensor technique uh, for monitoring uh, geodetic data. Okay, so uh, Damien shows this uh, diagram yesterday. Uh, this is a very epoch, epoch making, very, very important uh, result uh, to monitor the shallow or slow slip event. Uh, I don't think I need to explain details uh, of this diagram because Damian uh, give very nice talk about this. But the point is, uh, they observe the uh, transient uh, power pressure variation uh, within two weeks. And also uh, they observe this kind of variation, uh, let's say half a year, uh, every half a year or so. Uh, and the, uh, because of success for this observation, Japanese uh, headquarter of the earthquake research, they decided to use a uh, borehole data to evaluate 
uh, for coupling uh, sleep behavior in shallow part of Nankai subduction zone. And the JAMSTEC is now uh, uh, make a monthly report of those data to the headquarter of Japanese uh, earthquake research promotion. And this is the, uh, uh, the slow sleep history uh, we observed until now, uh, until today. As uh, the Damian's paper mentioned, uh, we regularly uh, observe the slow sleep event uh, every half a year or so. Uh, but one of the uh, very uh, exception is the slow sleep uh, we observed at end of 2020 uh, to the beginning of 2021. The size and the duration is uh, exceptionally large uh, with this event. So the Japanese earthquake committee, they are very much, at that time, they are very much concerned about uh, a large earthquake which uh, triggered by this event, but uh, uh, nothing happened. So uh, this is very good. And uh, yes, this is a record of the uh, variation of poor pressure by this event. And also, this is a record of tilt meter. We have uh, deployed a borehole and also a shallow or drill hole. Uh, I think the green one, uh, I mean, red and the yellow one is a data from uh, the borehole and the green one is from the tilt meter. So we observe the variation of tilt and the power pressure for more than, uh, continue to more than one month. And, uh, the uh, data is very complicated. So uh, we first, uh, we only use the uh, uh, poor pressure variation and the tilt uh, variation in five days in the, in the very beginning stage uh, to estimate the fault size and uh, moment magnitude of this event. And uh, the using poor pressure and uh, tilt data uh, in the first five days, uh, we estimate the fault size is, I mean, moment magnitude of this event in fi first five days is ma moment magnitude of 6.1. And also color indicate the uh, moment release by the low frequency ice or earthquake. And we have the uh, kind of the very green large uh, moment release patch uh, very uh, close to the fault area, oops, we estimate it uh, from the tilt and the power pressure. Yes. Okay. And uh, based on the successful borehole observation, uh, we uh, decided to deploy more borehole station uh, around the Dunet and also uh, western part of the uh, Nankai Tora, where now Japanese government, the new cable station, uh, cable network in uh, in the western part, which is so-called uh, internet system. And a new borehole station will be installed and connect, uh, will be connected to DUNET2 uh, network uh, this year, end of this year, by using CHIQ. And uh, yeah, just uh, for, you, for your information, uh, we Jamstack are uh, going to have the online workshop about this uh, Bohor Observatory de deployment cruise. Uh, so if you are interested in this project for participation, any stage, uh, please uh, uh, join this workshop. This is online workshop and you can uh, more information from JAMSTEC website about this. Okay. And in addition to Bohor Observatory, uh, our uh, system developing team, uh, they are now uh, developing and testing a fiber uh, optic uh, sensing technique uh, like DAS. Uh, and also uh, they are deploying a fiber strain sensor. They deployed uh, uh, a CFRO. And also, yes, as I mentioned before, uh, we, uh, already deployed Warhol optical uh, tilt meter. And uh, the DAS system, uh, using DAS system, uh, we successfully observed the uh, uh, shallow uh, tremor. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention. Uh, James, like we have the uh, this uh, red cable. This is already retired cable after we developed the uh, DUNET2 system. But uh, the cable is still very healthy and uh, we can 
uh, use this cable can be a test uh, site for fiber optic sensing. And uh, yes, uh, fiber optic uh, strain sensor, uh, we can uh, observe the uh, 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 plate motion scale, time scale uh, strain deviation. And also using tilt meter, uh, we observe the ground motion from uh, a far distant earthquake. Uh, looking about the result of the uh, DAS monitoring uh, more, see this is a record of, of the uh, shallow trimmer. And also uh, using this cable system, uh, we see the very uh, uh, long distance earthquake uh, wave train like this. And also uh, we got the uh, seismic velocity image below the cable using uh, ambient noise tomography. So th th we are still testing of the data quality and the uh, data acquisition system using that system. Uh, but uh, we uh, think that this uh, fiber optic sensing has very much potential to go to the next generation of uh, seafloor monitoring. Okay, so that is about uh, our uh, monitoring uh, we are doing in Nankai Trough, and I'm going to talk about a structure study in, in the Nankai Trough. So one of the motivation uh, for doing uh, large scale 3D seismic imaging uh, from several earthquake uh, observation. So for example, if you take a look at moment release of a VR event uh, or a, a slip deficit rate, uh, observed by C4 uh, uh, geodetic data, the uh, slip deficit and also moment release is not uniformly distributed. It again, they are very much patchy like distribution. And also, the recent receiver function study uh, in deeper part of subduction zone, they propose uh, that the uh, splitting of the oceanic plate uh, in the deeper part of the central part of the Nankai Trough. Uh, that means, uh, maybe this is uh, very natural to think, but uh, the, uh, that means uh, Nankai subduction zone uh, a mega thrust is not one single uh, simple dipping plane. The structure uh, may be very uh, 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 complicated geometry in 3D our scale. So uh, we believe that uh, we need the geophysical data to map the uh, much, much shorter wavelength variation of plate geometry and the physical property to construct a realistic model. So the realistic model uh, should be necessary uh, to make the uh, modeling study uh, to understand complicated sleep behavior. Oops. Okay, so uh, to obtain the uh, large scale 3D imaging, we, we are doing, let's say we call it the large scale 3D imaging, but actually uh, we are making very densely deployed 2D profile to cover the entire region of Nankai Trough to construct the 3D geometry of the plate by interpolating the 2D uh, 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 seismic image. So, uh, in the first year of this project, uh, we started this project uh, 2018. And uh, this is the uh, seismic reflection line we made in the first two years. And now uh, we already covered entire uh, Nankai Trough to the uh, Western part. And uh, in the last year, this year, we are going to have more data to cover the uh, entire Western I mean, eastern part of Nankai Trough. So after, I mean, uh, when we complete, we are going to complete this project, uh, uh, we can expect a very detailed 3D image of the plate geometry in the shallow part of Nankai Trough. Okay, and uh, the, these green dot uh, indicate the location of the uh, very low frequency earthquake. Ah, by the way, uh, those data is acquired are acquired by using JAMSTEC new research vessel, Kaimei. Uh, the, we had a research vessel or seismic vessel uh, named Kairei, but uh, that vessel was retired two years ago. 
And uh, now we are using a new best cell, Kaime, uh, which has a long streamer cable around the uh, large ergon array. So uh, this is the uh, uh, result of the first two years seismic reflection survey in the central part of Nankai Trough. Again, uh, the, we acquired uh, uh, 2D data and we uh, interpolate those uh, uh, data to make a 3D image of the plate boundary fold. And uh, uh, our final goal is to map, to make this kind of map uh, to cover the entire Nankai draft. And the point is <clears throat> the, uh, even in the, the central part of Nankai draft, the uh, subducting uh, megastrust for geometry is very complicated. So we see the, some kind of rich or bulge type of structure in the central part of our survey region in here. And about 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, we uh, got a uh, uh, seismic uh, refraction image of the large scale seamount along one single profile that is located somewhere in here. Uh, but uh, the uh, recent seismic result to map this 3D image uh, showed that that is not one single uh, large seamount, that is a seamount over. Uh, printed on the large uh, rich system. And also we uh, can observe the several small cement structure in here. Yes. And, uh, ah, and, and the very important observation or result uh, from the comparison of the geometry of the plate and distribution of BR event. Uh, BR event is uh, mainly or only observed the uh, Rich, subducted rich part and the seamount part. Uh, the activity is very quiet, both sides of the subducted rich system. And uh, this is, uh, yes, uh, something like this ca cartoon. We have subducting, actually, not uh, one single seamount, but very big, uh, rich uh, plus uh, seamount structure in Nankai Trough and uh, beer event occurred uh, around. Uh, the leach and subduction, uh, subducted uh, seamount system. And uh, one of the, uh, my students uh, take a look at, uh, now taking a look at uh, seismic section along uh, those profile. And he, uh, uh, this is very much pre uh, preliminary work, but he calculated the taper angle uh, of each profile. And he found that uh, the taper angle of subducted plate is very much uh, decrease in the area we observed uh, active VR, VR event. And uh, <clears throat> yes, so uh, this is still ongoing work and he is going to process uh, MCS data and more to see the duration between the structure and uh, uh, VR event uh, activity. Okay, oh, okay. Uh, in the MCS uh, study, we only, uh, we can only map the very shallow part where we observe the shallow arthroscopic uh, event. Uh, but uh, at, for the modeling of earthquake uh, cycle simulation, we need to uh, uh, know the uh, entire uh, non of subduction zone structure in 3D uh, scale. And uh, maybe you know uh, this study. This is the result of very good example of nice collaboration with uh, UTIC and the GNS and the GEMSTEC. And in this study, maybe I don't need to explain, but in this study, uh, the, we compiled all available uh, data of 20 years observation of onshore, offshore uh, recording of offshore shot, as well as uh, hypocenter distribution. And using uh, those data, we can uh, see the 3D variation of the uh, velocity structure in the entire Nankai draft. The one of the very important results from this survey is we can image uh, the, uh, uh, the protonic rock body intruded in overriding plate in the very central part of Nankai draft. Again, about 20 years, no, 15 years ago, uh, we uh, first found uh, this uh, plutonic rock image using one single 2D profile, but uh, using 
by compiling the all available data. Now uh, we uh, know the 3D volume and the 3D distribution and the size of the protonic rock intruded in the overriding plate. The, this structure is very important and uh, because the, this over, uh, protonic rock is located just on the segmentation boundary between Tonankai and Nankai earthquake. And uh, the previous earthquake observation shows that the uh, both earthquake are uh, initiated uh, around this protonic rock. So this is, a, I think, we think this is a key structure to control the initiation and propagation of the uh, large megathrust uh, fault sweep. And uh, several years ago, uh, one of the uh, numerical modeler uh, from Jamstack, uh, Hori San, he introduced this structure uh, in the plate boundary model, and he successfully uh, demonstrate the uh, uh, rupture pattern of the previous earthquake by introducing the uh, structure of the uh, intruded protonic rock in the middle of Nankai draft. Okay, so that is uh, pretty much everything we are doing uh, recently uh, with uh, Nankai draft area. And uh, in the next half of my talk, I'm going to uh, read a little bit about uh, what we are doing in Japan Ranch in the large uh, megathrust earthquake region. But I'm today I'm going to talk about uh, Outer lines region, not plate boundary uh, earthquake. Uh, the one of the motivation, uh, our motivation is from past observation. So the past observation shows that it is uh, common for shallow interplate normal faulting aftershock activity to be uh, activated within the subducting plate beneath the seaward trench slope after a large megathrust earthquake. Uh, but in some case, uh, not always, a large normal fault earthquake occurred. For example, uh, the Showa Sandik earthquake occurred in uh, 1894, uh, uh, I mean, 1933, after the Meiji Sandik earthquake, 1896. So, and also uh, another example of 207 and 206 uh, uh, um megathrust and normal fault event. But, but uh, if you take a look at uh, after, I mean, earthquake activity after the Hoku earthquake, magnitude eight cross earthquake have not occurred uh, in the outer ice region of Japan Trench. And also the, uh, soon after the, this earthquake occurred, uh, Son Rei, uh, he uh, made a very uh, 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 suggestive paper about the occurrence of the outer rise event in the seaward side of the uh, rupture zone. And in this paper, he mentioned that uh, increases in current stress of about five bar uh, in the outer rise at depths of 10, 15 kilometer for normal faulting geometry. Uh, but uh, whether or not this is uh, significant, this variation, I mean, current stress change is uh, significant in terms of potential greater earthquake faulting in, in outer lines region on many uh, unknown factors. Uh, for example, what are the precise outer trend slope faulting geometry uh, in this margin? And also, are there any uh, through going structure that could support rupture size of the uh, previous uh, normal fault event in 1933? And also uh, any such a fault near the fair threshold, such uh, that the stress perturbation have significantly advanced them uh, to other failure. Uh, he mentioned, uh, he pointed out those uh, point. Uh, but to answer uh, this question, we uh, have very little information about the geometry distribution and structure of the fault system in the outer lines region. So this is very much motivation. Uh, we started this project. And another motivation is from the uh, uh, tsunami early warning system. So uh, the tsunami early warning system I uh, mentioned before uh, is uh, established very much around Japan. And uh, this system already uh, operated in the uh, Japan Trench region. 
uh, but those systems uh, need tsunami database and uh, we need to know we need to use the realistic uh, fault uh, fault data set to make the uh, uh, tsunami data set. But again, if you take a look at the uh, outerized region, we have very little information about uh, fault distribution. So it's very uh, hard to make a reliable uh, tsunami database uh, at that moment. So that's why uh, this is the reason we started the outerized project. In this uh, outerized project, uh, we have been doing uh, large scale seismic imaging along those profiles and also uh fine scale seismic imaging and also monitoring earthquake activity and bathymetry mapping and using those data uh, we constructed a fault map uh, of the outer lines for distribution and then uh, we made a tsunami assessment using realistic uh, tsunami fault map okay the first thing we have done is large scale uh, seismic survey to uh, find out uh, where normal fault uh, system uh, are developed. So uh, what we have done is uh, we deployed the many, many OBSs along those uh, profiles. So this is uh, a result of seismic refraction tomography along this profile, Korea Trench profile, and uh, along Japan Trench profile. Seismic velocity shows a very much typical oceanic cluster velocity structure. The thickness is very uniform. And, but if you take a look at uh, those two diagrams below, the middle one is, uh, uh, shows the velocity perturbation uh, in the mantle flattened along the moho. And the third one is uh, BTVS ratio uh, structure of the, uh, in the crust, again, flattened uh, along the basement. Uh, this is uh, Korea Trench and this is Japan Trench. And both uh, results show that uh, we have velocity reduction and also increase of VTVS within the crust about 150 kilometers away from the trench. So we believe that uh, this suggests that the faulting uh, in uh, outerized region promote water penetration in the oceanic crust and the upper most mantle. And the important information from those survey is outerized, uh, the area of affected by outerized development is about 150 kilometers away from the trench. So uh, in those area, we deployed uh, the many OBS to monitor the aftershock distribution uh, starting soon after the earthquake. The important point is uh, we observed uh, many aftershock, but uh, uh, most of or all of them show the normal fault uh, mechanism down to 40 kilometer uh, deep. The important point is before Tohoku-Oki earthquake, normal faulting earthquake occurred at shallower than 20 kilometer, uh, and uh, the reverse fault mechanism uh, observed at the 40 kilometer. But, uh, the aftershock activity, I mean, the activity after the uh, Tohoku earthquake, the earthquake occurred in outerized region is everything is uh, extension uh, normal fault system. And this suggests that the stress regime in the Pacific plate was uh, changed by the 2011 Tohoku Oki earthquake. Okay, so this is a result of our monitoring in the central part of the uh, Japan Trench Outerized region. The blue dot shows the uh, distribution of aftershock, and you can see the very clear uh, straight lineation. And also, uh, those lineation is observed at the uh, uh, graben, along the graben, uh, graben region. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna uh, briefly explain the seismic reflection survey that we acquire the seismic reflection data along those profile, mainly uh, the area uh, 150 kilometers away from the trench. And uh, in the first stage, we use the previous, I mean, former seismic vessel Kairei, uh, but uh, in the later stage, yeah, we use the vessel, new vessel Kaimei. 
and uh, the Kaimei has much more larger airgun volume and a shorter uh, streamer cable with a shorter uh, channel interval. The cable length is both uh, 5,000 something or 6,000 uh, meter. Okay, so uh, this is one of the example of seismic reflection image along the outer eyes region, uh, plastic time migrated section. Uh, with interpretation uh, with pro, uh, with uh, seismic activity. So uh, in this section, we can see that host grab and normal fault uh, formed a very high angle normal fault system and seismicity along, observed along the graben, uh, as you can see the map and also seismic image. And also the, the uh, unclear moho uh, reflection at the earthquake cluster region, the, we have some kind of discontinuous uh, image of the Moho, and uh, uh, there is unclear region of the Moho where we observed uh, our aftershock distribution. And those observations may support uh, the idea of continuation of high angle normal fold uh, down to uppermost mantle. And this is uh, another example of the uh, seismic reflection image, which across the fault zone of the largest uh, uh, normal fault earthquake with magnitude 7.6. See, we have the uh, aftershock of this event uh, in here, and uh, they are distributed from crust to mantle. Along, looks like along very high angle normal fault system. Okay, and uh, we calculate, we estimated the deep angle of the fault, which is about 60 to 70 kilo, uh, degree, which is very high uh, angle. But this uh, value is not consistent with the deep angle of the fault uh, focal solution obtained by a teleseismic wave. Uh, the Kanamori and uh, 1971, they uh, got the uh, deep of the fault about 45 uh, degree and another tsunami inversion shows a much more shallow uh, deep angle and one of the uh, kind of speculation uh, to understand those inconsistency is a uh, possible interpretation or speculation is uh, shallowing deep angle to other stress neutral uh, depths so uh, suggesting to consider kind of Two plane model or compound model of normal fault, which show the shallow dip uh, and the steep dip at the deeper and the shallow uh, region, respectively, some, something like uh, this uh, along the uh, left dot line. This is uh, still very much speculation. Uh, okay, let's get back to the fault uh, mapping. See, uh, using seismic reflection and also our basimetry image, uh, earthquake distribution, uh, we uh, map the uh, fault, outerized fault system, uh, like this red and blue uh, uh, lines. And then uh, to define the potential earthquake fault, the fault having the same sense of dip and the same strike within five kilometer apart are connected to each other. And also uh, we only uh, plot the uh, fault with length is more than uh, 40 kilometer long to, uh, to assess the uh, kind of large uh, tsunami generation. So this is the uh, map of the uh, potential normal fault earthquake in uh, outer lines region we uh, mapped using uh, uh, seismic and earthquake and basimetry data. And then uh, we made a tsunami assessment using a tsunami modeling. And uh, we have 33 basic fault based on geophysical observation. And for tsunami calculation, we assume the deep angle is about 60 and the width and depth of the fault is uh, 40 kilometer, which is the same as the uh, depth limit of normal fault earthquake. And also we use the uh, uh, scaling law of the uh, normal fault earthquake, which published uh, previously. And uh, this is uh, one of the example of tsunami uh, modeling 
using the longest uh, fault we mapped. The uh, tsunami, maximum tsunami wave at course is 27 meter, uh, somewhere in the middle of the north, northwestern part of Japan. Uh, so this is example of tsunami calculation. And more important uh, result from the tsunami mapping and the tsunami calculation, we looks like we found the uh, fault of 1933 uh, Showa Sandik earthquake. The uh, using the uh, our fault number ten, this thick green one, we calculated uh, a tsunami height along coastline. Uh, with, and uh, we plotted uh, with observed data. Actually, the observed and the calculated tsunami height uh, matched very, very, very good. And uh, uh, the observed data plotted just below the red and uh, uh, blue and calculated one. So uh, the conclusion is uh, tsunami fitting is very tsunami uh, height fitting is very, very well. So in order to assess the tsunami uh, fitting, we calculated the K value. Uh, that is a geometrical average of ratio between the maximum tsunami height of the uh, uh, model and of the observed data. Uh, K value one means uh, observed and calculated the tsunami height uh, matched very, very well. So uh, we calculated uh, K value from all uh, available um, fault uh, information. And we found that uh, only uh, our uh, fault number 10 uh, showed the uh, K value uh, is uh, equal one. So this, our approach is very much hard uh, modeling approach, but uh, this uh, fault number 10 uh, or explained the uh, observed tsunami height almost perfectly. And uh, we also calculated the K, K value using the fault model obtained by previous inversion study. Uh, the, some of them I explained very well, some of them are not very well, uh, but uh, compare uh, with our, our model and their result, uh, we found that our uh, Fault number 10 explained the tsunami height, observed the tsunami height uh, much better than inversion result. Yes, uh, and also I will not explain detail, but uh, if we introduce the compound uh, fault model, that uh, uh, fault model also uh, much more well explained the tsunami waveform, uh, especially in the very first uh, uplift phase. The only compound model can explain that. Okay, so now uh, we believe that this fault number 10 uh, should be the fault of the uh, Showa Sun Liquid earthquake. And we have the seismic reflection line crossing this fault. And this fault number 10 is located here and here. This is the interpretation and here. And uh, if you take a look at the zoom up section, the fault number 10 is located here. We see the very big offset of the basement, uh, but within the crust and the mantle, we don't see any uh, clear seismic reflection interface or event uh, showing the fault zone. So we uh, don't know why we can image uh, the fault along the this system. Uh, maybe because this uh, fault is too steep uh, to image using a six kilometer long stream cable or some other region. We are still uh, working on it to get the much more nice image <coughs> of this fault. Okay, so future uh, direction. And now we are doing our uh, same uh, geophysical study in the southern part of Korea Trench to map uh, the uh, normal fault system. And uh, in the future, uh, we, yes we are going to uh, create combined source fault model from Japan Trench and the Korea Trench. Uh, yes, that is one thing we have to do in the future. And also in the Japan Trench, uh, we would like to estimate current stress change of the Japan Trench authorized region using realistic fault model uh, distribution. Yes, that is one thing we would like to try in Japan Trench. Okay. 
Yes, uh, this is very much the last one. Just I would like to make an advertisement of future uh, study in Japan Trench. CQ drilling vessel will return to Japan Trench in 2024. And uh, the uh, IODP expedition 405, so called J track, is scheduled uh, in, uh, yes, in 2024. And uh, one of the uh, big overall goal is uh, understand the variation of the physical and the chemical property of the sediment and fluid of the near trench mega thrust uh, that enabled huge uh, forward displacement and generation of very large tsunami. So this is the uh, overall goal, but uh, the, I think important expected result from the uh, JTRAC project is we can go back to Japan Trench uh, about 10 years after the J first, so that we can see the probably uh, kind of heating process of the fault uh, using the core and the data from the uh, JTRAC uh, project. Yes, uh, the, we propose to the real, to the real site. One is the uh, same as the JTRAC, I mean, J first site, and the other one is the uh, incoming crate at the reference site. So we are going to discuss more detail uh, about the uh, actual implementation plan of this uh, JTRAC project very soon. Okay, so this is the last one. Uh, uh, we jump step going to the uh, subduction zone project to understand the strip and the coupling behavior and also to construct uh, uh, the realistic uh, subduction model. And uh, we are going to make uh, the modeling study to estimate uh, temporal evolution of sleep behavior using uh, monitoring data and imaging data. That is uh, the very much direction we should go uh, in the future. Okay, that's it. I'm very happy to take questions. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Kundayarsan. Uh, impressive stuff. Holy moly. Questions? Great talk. Um, you you showed some um, tsunami modeling and obviously the, the, the fault geometry and the detailed bathymetry would, should play a large role in that. But earlier you also showed from uh, DAS um, installations that you also had recently some very good shallow shear wave velocity constraints. I was wondering if they play a role in your assessment of tsunami risk. Using a cable, uh, fiber optic cable. Yes. Uh, we are testing, but uh, the, this is very big discussion. Uh, the fiber optic sensing using a dust system is how much sensitive about pressure change. The dust system is very sen sensitive to the strain variation that that's to monitor the tsunami, we need a pressure variation. So uh, the, we, the point is that, that the fiber sensing is, is uh, sensitive about the pressure change or not. We are, are still are testing about that. But looks like I'm not very sensitive about the tsunami wave uh, by the uh, dust technique. But uh, the difficulty is uh, it's very, difficult to observe actual tsunami. We have to wait for your quick. Yes. Questions. So I wonder for the case of the shallow structural variations, non-kind to non -kind, we now know a whole lot more. And you mentioned the, um, the pluton that, that was imaged and their indications from receiver functions there's some sort of tear in the plate. And I wonder in terms of the link to deeper undulations in the interface, what do we know about the cause and the effect? Because when you when you look at the interface from seismicity, there's corrugations from sort of 50 to 100 kilometers depth from what I understand. And then there are these shallow features. So is the idea that you have a shallow control of the deep slab, or is there some deep slab tearing first, and then you have a response at the surface? Question. I don't have any good answer, just a speculation. Uh, probably both. It's, uh, you know, interact each other. Of course, the in general 
speaking the slab uh, subducting due to the their weight itself. So that means deeper part control subduction. Uh, but in shallow part, if you take a look at shallow part, we have to think about interaction between overriding plate and the subducting plate. And as uh, we can see the uh, uh, birth image, overriding plate is shows a very complicated structure. In some part, we have the uh, weak material, in some part, the strong material, which may generate uh, the structure variation of subducting freight. So I don't have any good answer, but uh, maybe deeper part and the shallow part uh, uh, both has some kind of reason to make the variation of the freight. I guess sort of related to that is when you look at the the gravity or the admittance across that uh, margin, uh, what do you see? And and also, what do you see in the geological record of topographic evolution, for example? Is there you know is there something there where one could look at the you know the mass accretion rate variation to see if it's shallow or you know where or or a deeper control? Yeah, good point. Again, it's very difficult to answer uh, based on my study. Uh, but the, the important point is uh, we should take a look at the geological structure in the uh, much wider region, and also the uh, you know the Dan Bassett and the, he may he uh, process the gravity data and uh, to consider the correlation between gravity That's and right, the geological right. structure. That thing is one thing we should do to understand the structure uh, variation. So, Diana-san, thank you for the presentation, very uh, comprehensive. I have two questions. I will start with the second one, second one which is actually uh, very close to what uh, Thorsten was asking. How often do you uh, acquire bathymetric data? Uh, about which area? For any of those areas, because I, I think uh, you said that you use the bathymetric, uh, bathymetric lineaments, and I would like to see, first of all, if you, share, you see any difference in the sea floor uh, before or after the uh -huh. big earthquakes. For example, that is like more like a, uh, let's say, uh, see the displacement before or after. But I think if you do bathymetric measurements every, let's say, one year or two, Maybe you should see any like um, um, low frequency movements in the area that might start explaining what is happening actually. If the thrust is the main source or on the shallow part of uh, that is moving, or maybe it is is reactive or actually is not reactive in that case. Yeah, good, good point. The uh, <clears throat> repeated bathymetry survey uh, showed us very good information about co-seismic uh, seafloor displacement, like we did after the Tohoku earthquake. But usually, for the bathymetry mapping, we acquire data just once. Yeah, because of mapping, you know, purpose. Uh, but uh, after the Tohoku earthquake, we realized that repeated bathymetry survey is a very powerful tool to know the seafloor displacement if you have a large slip. So, uh, so we are doing some along some profile uh, to acquire bathymetry data uh, several times, uh, but, but not very much. Yeah, I think it will be interesting, especially when you map the lineaments to, to see what is changing after a big earthquake. I think it will be really, really important. My second question is, you mentioned that you, um, you have all these seabed geodetic instruments. What is the interstation distance of those instruments? And have you calculated the resolution of uh, any we haven't calculated the resolution, but uh, uh, the we have several uh, geodetic sensor. Uh, but uh, if you uh, think about vertical resolution, uh, we uh, uh, we can acquire vertical uh, uh, displacement. I'm displacement mm -hmm. using pressure gauge, and the pressure gauge distribution is something like that. Uh, we have the uh, uh, tsunami, 55 tsunami sensor. Uh, and that is like 20 kilometers? Uh, something like that, yes. But this is about uh, highest, I mean, densest case of yeah. the geodetic observation. You see the nice uh, 
plot that you showed how much the, the, the resolution is changing with time, I think, because you have measurement from 2006, 2016. And I think it's good to see. Oh, I'm sorry. It's good to see uh, with time how much your um, the, the, the uncertainty is changing so you, you can use this data. Oh, sorry. Edward. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering if these large normal faulting earthquakes pose a tsunami hazard in other trenches such as the Nankai Trough or whether the Japan Trench is sort of a special case. Nankai Trough. See, in, in historical data, we have no uh, kind of data indicating a normal fault event in Nankai Trough region. And also, if you take a look at the basimetry image, in the Nankai and Japan Trench. In Japan Trench, we see the very clear, strong horse graben structure. But in Nankai, uh, we don't see such kind of the uh, uh, structure uh, in the basimetry image. So uh, I, this is my very personal uh, opinion, but I don't think we have very big chance to occur a normal fault event in uh, outer lies, I mean, seaward side of Nankai Trough region. So what's to control the plate age? I mean, plate I, age, subduction direction. So in terms of the partitioning of the slip or the, the rate? Uh, geometry, geometry, bending. The bending, the degree yeah. of bending. Also, plate age is very important to decide that kind of stiffness. Very interesting why, why it's so different. Can you hand it to Simone? Yeah, great talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. So I have just a question looking at this figure. So how did you choose the location of donuts or the or the different stations? So how do yeah, how did you choose, choose them? Donut? Like how do you choose, for example, donut one is very kind of a narrow in ah. a very narrow region instead of donut two yeah, is very or, like or, widespread. The original idea is uh, we observe the aspect, I mean aspect uh, distribution from the both side of the segmentation boundary in the career, uh, I mean key peninsula. Uh, we have the segmentation boundary of the two earthquake, and uh, we try to monitor the earthquake activity uh, from the both sides. And uh, also, it is very hard to cross the cable this canyon. This is a very deep, uh, steep structure. The point is, uh, we try to monitor the uh, initiation point of the large earthquake using both network. Yeah. So I guess same same question and. So in an ideal world, your observational capabilities would give you an early warning where something is happening. And then the next step would be to try to predict if you have a joint rupture or segmented rupture, is that the key information? Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, this, it's, it's yeah, an, this is a segmentation boundary and, uh, you know, the historical data tell us that the uh, eastern part ruptured first and uh, several days or years af uh, after that the uh, western part occurred. And the recent seismological study suggests that uh, there is may occur the slow sleep event along, along the rupture zone after the mega slow earthquake. So we try to monitor such kind of our slow sleep event to predict next one. It's a sort of an interesting question. When you think about what would an optimal experiment look like? We're thinking about it for Cascadia, for example. And then the question is, well, what would you know? So it's it's the segmentation that really you can get to with a real time instrumentation. Anyway, do we have a last question? Can you hand it over? Super. Great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question with the new borehole station that's being installed. Um, at the other transect, there's always been at least two pore pressure sensor stations. How do you envision utilizing just like the single location? Just because in other analysis, I know that like Damien has done, they've been able to look at like the relative distribution to slip relative to the two stations and like figure out like where slip is like moving relative to those. But having a single station, I envision that being a little harder. Yeah, ideally, if we have a money time, now of, of course, uh, uh, we should deploy more than one single station. Uh, but uh, in the real world, so we have some kind of uh, limited budget on the time. So we have to decide uh, just one station in here. But in the near future, we are going to deploy uh, another 
sensor in much western part, but again, one single station there and one more. So totally, we are going to deploy three station more. Yeah. Even in Japan, constraints before. <laughs> Thank you. I have, a, I have a thought that maybe it will be helpful. When we monitor landslides, for example, we put anchor points, we put reflectors, and then we put lasers on the other side, let's say, of the of the landslides, so we can see if there is any movement. And this is something we do also sometimes with LiDAR and things like that. It wouldn't be helpful if you anchor some reflectors to the seabed and then you do bathymetric measurements on top every once, every let's say six months. Wouldn't it be cheaper than having all this equipment that it is very expensive, not only to deploy, but to maintain as well? Yeah, Japanese group do, uh, doing a similar approach. They deployed uh, uh, acoustic station, uh, acoustic uh, uh, emission station and the receiver station, and they try to measure the distance, uh, yes, uh, crossing the uh, uh, trench axis to move the uh, speed of the parade motion, yeah. Okay, let's thank Kodaira-san again for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much.